If you're just now joining us, last week Pastor Steve started a series called David. Uh, we're looking at the life of the man after God's own heart. We've got a shepherd boy to my right, all the way to the king. And we're going to try to cover a lot of Old Testament scripture for you. But there's a lot to learn from this guy, David. It's a story of real life. He's complicated, he's messy, he's broken, but it's real. And one thing that we can understand and find ourselves in today is that in the midst of real life, we can learn of David's real faith. Faith that will engage the messy, faith that will engage the broken, faith that will take it on head on. And David teaches us that real life requires real faith. This is the kind of faith that we need today in the midst of our lives. I encourage you, if you haven't yet, I know that on your smartphone, you might have a Bible app or the Legacy app. Well, there's some great scripture on there for you to follow along today and to take notes. I also know Instagram and Facebook are on your phone too. So if you check those while I'm preaching, maybe just do a shout out to the church because I've been there too. But I know that if we will place our intention and our focus on the word of God specifically, we're gonna leave here for the better today. So we're gonna dive in to picking up where David Story left off last week. If you missed us, let me just recap really quick. If you know anything about David, he's a pretty famous guy. He did a lot of good and a lot of bad. And right now we're in the story where he is being groomed for what's coming. He just defeated Goliath, which is an amazing story of victory and a testament of God always using um, the most unlikely people to do something impossible. And we're gonna pick up a little bit after that today. So if you'll follow along, we're gonna jump into 1 Samuel 18. This is about 10 verses, so I will read, and they'll be on the screen, and it says, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home, after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and they danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals, and this was their song, Saul has killed the thousands, and David the tens of thousands. This little song made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with the ten thousands, but me only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. I'm gonna pause there really quick. They've just introduced us to these two characters in this lineage that's really important in Old Testament. We've got Saul, who's king, and David. If you know anything, Samuel already anointed him to be king. He's the most unlikely candidate, but he's not there yet. And so he just came off this big victory, and everyone is celebrating. He's so famous that the women wrote a song. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, and Saul had a spear in his hand, and suddenly he hurled at David, intending to pin him to the wall, but David escaped him twice. Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. And finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander over a thousand men, and David faithfully led his troops into battle. Verse 14, David continued to succeed in everything he did for the Lord was with him. And when Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he was successful at leading his troops into battle. So I read a lot of scripture up front and we're gonna refer back to this story and I'm gonna paraphrase some of it because it's probably four or five chapters in 1 Samuel. I encourage you, that's great reading um, on your own time just to look at the details of David's life. But today we're gonna... Think about what is God doing in the wilderness? And so we pick up in this story. David has defeated Goliath, and Saul brought him back to live with him. He's obviously incredibly successful at everything he does. I know that sometimes scripture can seem like kind of plain, and I want you to think about in Hebrew writing, just a note in verse 7 of why Saul is reacting so dramatically is because just that subtle increase in, in Hebraic writing is intentionally intensifying the statement, even a number from thousands to tens of thousands. So Saul's really, really upset because the the community is celebrating David and not him anymore. And so his jealousy and fear are beginning to consume Saul, and we're gonna see how it leads him towards destruction. I would encourage you today, if you get nothing else from what I teach you, write down verse 14, where it says, David continued to succeed in everything he did for the Lord was with him. That's a great verse to remind us if we want success, we gotta do it God's way. So we picked up here and Saul's losing his mind to the flesh. And if anyone in this room is honest, when we commit to what our sinful nature is telling us to do, it becomes all consuming and it clouds our vision and it's never satisfied. And we're gonna see that 
as the message unfolds, how it changed Saul, how it consumed him. And the first instance of the situation, as you read in the scriptures, that Saul actually would rather have David dead, one David, than thousands of dead Philistines, which is wild because he's the king, he's the protector, he's the leader, Saul on this side, and he wants David, who's only claiming victory, to die versus the very tribe that's attacking his entire kingdom, livelihood, and people. That's how corrupt fear and jealousy have turned Saul for him to see. The livelihood is very threatened and he's still committed to it. But because, get this, of Saul's disobedience, he's failing. And I will tell you this, for the believer, drama always follows disobedience. If you haven't seen it in your own life, you've probably seen it in somebody somebody else's. And so to keep going in chapter 18, Saul realizes he can't kill David. God just keeps protecting him. He threw a spear. So he says, I'm going to offer my daughter's hand in marriage and I'm going to say, you can have this, but I need you to do this. And it's an unbelievable ask. He says, I want 100 foreskins of the Philistines. So I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone's foreskin, much less a giant's foreskin or a hundred of them. <laughs> Sorry, it's the Bible if that's offensive, not me. <laughs> so he asks him to do something absolutely ridiculous, and David not only does it, but he doubles it. He brings back 200. You know what? It's, I know that's kind of funny, but think about what, what he had to go through killing giants we can skip the other part of the trophy, so to speak, but that's a whole nother process, <laughs> my gosh. Um, anyway, he does this, and Saul's like, what the heck, how is this guy still doing everything I've asked? He should have died, 100 giants, much less 200, and it's amazing what God will do when you walk in his favor. All David's doing is he's saying, here's my yes, Lord, regardless of the circumstance that is being thrown my way in life. If we can adopt that attitude today, church family, we can change the world. Because nobody acts like that. Nobody, even Christians, we really, really struggle with submission to what life is going to bring us. His posture of humility is what is moving the heart of God to bring him success. So he brings uh, this wife, just to pick back up in the story, he brings his daughter, and actually David says no, because he says, hey, I'm from a very poor, humble family. You're from royalty. This isn't right. So for whatever reason, he knew that God did not want him to be with the first daughter that Saul proposed. But the second daughter, I think her name is Michael, but I'm going to say it's Michael because my name is Michael. And so the second daughter actually falls in love with David. And there's a really interesting thing that happens because he chose this wife. I'm just paraphrasing chapter 18 for you to show you that God is always working it was really important that it was her becoming his eventual life because this marriage alliance, later on when David's gonna become king, you'll see in the coming weeks of the series, it's actually establishing the credentials with the northern tribes of Israel for when David becomes king. So all things work for God's purpose. So David's fame is just continuing to rise and guess what? Saul's anger and jealousy are just burning with every success he's tried everything to conquer him. I'm going to pick back up in 1 Samuel 19. He says, but when one day when Saul was sitting at home with the spear in hand, the tormenting spirit from the Lord suddenly came upon him again. David played his harp and Saul hurled the spear at David. David dodged out of the way and leaving the spear stuck in the wall, he fled and escaped into the night. Now there may be some people in here that have some experience throwing like cups, plates, uh, whatever as significant others, but a spear is a whole nother level. And he threw it so hard, it stuck in the wall. So David gets it. He gets it at this moment and he says, I gotta go. He escapes into the night and this is where we're gonna camp out for the majority of what God has for us because he heads to the wilderness. I'm gonna ask you for, for a minute just to journey with me by putting yourself in David's shoes. I know that this has a lot of stories of people that went through things and it's really, really important that we realize that it's us, that we're David. And so I want you to think about what he's doing. He ends up having to leave everything behind and flee. Now, I'm sure the accommodations, you know, in 2000 BC weren't incredible, but at least it was a roof and there was probably a fire, uh, maybe access to water. And here David has given all that up, everything he knows that's familiar to flee into the wilderness 
because Saul's after to kill him. And he's actually a fugitive when in fact, David has done nothing wrong. And he's stewarded everything that the king has asked him to do a very well. And even though he's anointed king, if you look back in what Samuel did, sure doesn't look like it right now. So here we are, we're with David, we're in the wilderness, everything's gone wrong, so what do we do next? And the reason I ask you that is there's a lot of people in this room and there's a lot of people online and have you ever done anything right but you still feel like you lost everything? Do you feel like you've been exiled to what we're calling the wilderness? And from time to time, we know that we all have a wilderness experience, whether that's financial strain or debt, marital issues, when your passion and your jobs just won't align, when you're full of doubt and questions about your faith, why are things happening, when your children are not who they should be, when you lose a loved one or a friend, when you've been betrayed, maybe sickness or illness, you feel lonely or depressed, like something's not right, nothing's working out for you. You know what, we've all been there and most of us honestly are there right now. We've all got something that we can say, hey Michael, that is my wilderness. What do I do next? Let me tell you this, when it comes to God, this is a hard truth. We're gonna be tempted, especially in modern society, to always blame everything else, to blame our King Saul and wonder why God doesn't just remove it. Some of us may have that theology that, oh, I got saved and now everything's gonna work right. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, Jesus says otherwise, that it's gonna be harder. So when you signed up to be a believer, you signed up for the wilderness. And we're gonna see in a little bit what that means. And when you blame your King Saul, let me remind you that God doesn't have his eye on King Saul. He's watching you and what you're gonna do with the situation at hand. Just like I said earlier, we've seen David two for two on putting his yes on the table, submitting to the faithfulness of God. And that's the thing about the wilderness, right? You can be in the most successful season of your life and still be in it. And it's when you are so successful that you start to attempt to fix things for yourself. And because you're successful, because you think you can do it on your own, you still have to wait on God. If you want what he has for you, then you have to wait on him. Don't fix it for yourself because it's never gonna be as good as God's gonna do. So what do we do in the wilderness today? Let me tell you this, God is always gonna use the wilderness in your life. I wish I could tell you that, you know what, you got saved two years ago and it was wilderness free. It was problem free, it was pain free. That's not true. So can God trust you with that calling he's put on your life when you said, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ? You know, David, more than one time, Saul tried to kill him. And David could have killed him back and it probably would have been justified. David probably could have taken the situation in his own hands, you know, and said, hey, Saul's trying to kill me. I don't want to die. God's giving me favor, favor, favor. And honestly, if he would have killed Saul, just with the camaraderie and the celebration of the community for his success, they probably would have absolutely not even questioned David taking the throne and doing that. But, but David's smarter because he knows to trust God. And so we're finding out in 1 Samuel 19 and 20 that David is out there. He's in a cave. He's on the run. He's really, really struggling in the wilderness. And for us today, we can say, you know what? Wilderness seasons are a constant in the game of life. You will fault yourself as a believer when you say that I'm immune to it because I follow Jesus. Because all of us, from this side to that side, top to bottom, we're either in the wilderness, we're going into the wilderness, or we're leaving the wilderness, whatever that would be defined in your life. And what I find interesting today is how different David responds in the wilderness compared to his ancestors. So I'm gonna track back really quick. If you know the story of the Israelites with Exodus and Moses, they kinda had the same season. So what are we seeing? There's a pattern in how God works and I'm gonna reveal that to you in a few minutes. But David is having a completely alternate response and getting different results. Israel in the wilderness responded with grumbling, unbelief, idolatry, if you know the story of Exodus. And David is responding with faith and trust and confidence and submission. And guess what, we can learn today from both examples because David's modeling for us how to trust God and grow in our faith. His experience reminds us that his satisfaction, his strength is found only in God. Now if you could just readjust your situation today by listening to what I'm about to tell you. 
it'll make life a whole lot easier. You see, the wilderness is God's design. It's an experience to remind us that God is in control and he's our creator. And the way that he does this is because when you are removed from when things are going well and things are going favorable, there are things that make you have new desires and hungers and need for God. And so instead of resisting it, church family, we've got to shift our perspective on the definition of what that part of our life is to say that, you know what, I know that I'm either going in, coming out, or about to go in, and that's gonna be cyclical until I die. What do I do with it? Well, now that I know that God used it in David's life to grow him, to draw him closer, to create something new so you can know God new, that's what he's doing for us today. So regardless of how awful, how terrible, how stressful your wilderness is today, I'm not here to diminish whatever you're feeling because we walk alongside a lot of people going through horrible, unexplainable, heartbreaking things. We can look at the story of David today and say, you know what, he's gonna do something with this. I may not see it now, but, but his promise is, is true because it was true for David, it's true for me. Now knowing that the wilderness in our lives will create new hungers and new needs of God, we look at what David asks for and guess what he doesn't desire most of? He doesn't ask for deliverance or provision, which is mind blowing because for us, as the frail humans that we are, every single time something gets hard or ugly, all we wanna do is get out and be released. And if we have this perspective, this God perspective, this David perspective of how to handle it when it's hard, we can see that God has something greater in it beyond than just the pain and the hurt and the struggle. We're here to learn that God is with us in it and he wants to use it for our good and his glory, as ugly as it may seem. Because David isn't saying, release me, provide for me. He's not, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I want more of your presence, God. I want more of your presence in my broken season. I want more of your presence through this diagnosis, through this heartbreak. And church family, can you imagine what would happen if hundreds of believers in this church picked up that mantle and that posture to say, God, regardless of the situation, regardless of what life is throwing me, I want more of you. That is how we change the world. That is how we change the people around us because of the difference, the difference that that posture will make and create, and God will use it. The sun and the dry heat of the desert of the wilderness never dried out David's trust in God. In fact, it caused him to turn to God for refuge and refreshment. I think it's really interesting if you really wanna know David's mind, what's really cool about the Bible, like we get to know the end of the story. We know that he does some really bad things and some other things and we know about Noah and we know a lot about heroes of faith. I mean, we don't know what the return on like, you know, me preaching today is gonna bring because the Bible's not written about me or you or Pastor Steve or anybody, but we can look knowing ahead, we can skip and see the, See, like, hey, David's in a really bad spot, but the end. Then we know the victory, so it was worth it. It's a lot harder for us because it's not gonna be written of, of what the return is of our faithfulness in the wilderness season. But I bring that up because Psalm 63 was written by David when he was in the wilderness. And I encourage you to read it this week because it's just a psalm of praise and adoration to God, which is absolutely crazy to think about the difficulty of the situation he was in when it would be really like okay for us to be like, yeah, I could see like you don't wanna believe in God anymore because there's a guy trying to kill you and all you've done is be successful and choose honor and choose faithfulness and you're still out here with nothing, no food, no shelter, nothing. You're in the wilderness on the run from everything in your life that's comfortable. And yet he writes Psalm 63 in the midst of that season to praise God just to demonstrate the heart and posture of what we should carry when we're in these seasons, church family. David doesn't view these present circumstances. He doesn't allow them to diminish his view of God, but he allows his big view of God to give perspective to his difficult circumstances. The God that he trusts is bigger than these trials that he's facing. And that's true for us today because God is watching us in our wilderness. If we're honest, there's so much temptation to flip when you're in the wilderness. I'm sure every one of us that's a believer could say, hey, I watched 
person A, B, C, D, E in my life. Get saved and be on fire for God and, and be pursuing his will and be pursuing his church body and family. And then when stuff gets hard, they're gone. The first wilderness because they didn't have a proper understanding of how God's design work. Is there anybody else that says, you know what, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people fall to the wayside just when life gets hard and we've probably been there ourselves. We could probably also say, you know what, there was a difficult season in my life and I wasn't ready and I didn't have the right posture and I fell away from God. It happens. But I wanna tell you why God creates the wilderness and I hope that by learning this, just as it helped me, will help us get through it in a way better way, in a way more productive way, in a way more God-honoring way. Because we're ultimately just submitting to the sovereignty of God. David needs to learn that God is gonna protect him. And so think about this, how else can he learn that? Can he, can he learn that when things are going great and things are easy and when he's surrounded by an army and, and a city and all these things? No, you know where he has to learn that? When he's all alone with nothing. How else is God gonna teach him to trust him and that he's gonna protect him? You think about this, with all of these resources to King Saul, he's still unable to touch David. David could only have written these passages in Psalm and all the things that he did after going through this wilderness training. That's what it is, it's used for that. Because he's not a shepherd boy anymore. He is in training school to become king. You know, and maybe David is sitting there thinking, oh, if I was just like shadowing Saul, I would learn how to be king. Or if I was just hanging out in the, in the palace and having grapes and wine or whatever they had back then, um, I would learn how to be king. Well, that's not God's intention. He has to physically remove David and put him into some very difficult circumstances to train him to use it because there's always preparation in the pain. God is allowing David to be chased all over the country so that he could expose him to the people of God. Now, if you know this about Israel, there's tribes scattered everywhere. They're not very united and they've been under attack. And so you know what's really interesting, the way God works? David probably never thought some of these things would have turned out in his life. He never would have thought that marrying daughter number two and daughter number one would help him unite the northern tribes later on, just because of who he married to. He never would have thought that being on the run all around Israel would have been used to be exposed to these other people so that when he's king, he has un unity. You know, he kills Goliath and everyone's crying out, he's a great warrior, and so when he's traveling through the land on the run, these people are knowing him now. David's name must have been household and his reputation was still superb, regardless of what Saul was, was telling the people and pursuing. Because God is using the testing to prepare David and the people for what is coming. David would soon be king over a united Israel. And so the people had to somehow know to come and come to know and to trust him. And God, God's way is doing, hang on one second. So the people had to know and to trust him, all of these tribes. So David is taking this very alternative path to leadership. It looks like a disaster, but it's actually the sovereign power of God using it because his way is always different than the way that we would have things go by. You know that God could have easily just removed Saul. He could have put David on the throne. In fact, he already said, David, you're gonna be king through Samuel, through prophecy. It's a couple chapters before in 1 Samuel. God could have done that, and how much are we the same where we say, God, I wish you would do that for me. Can you remove my King Saul? Can you remove me out of the wilderness today? But if we did that, if David did that, what would he miss? Would he be trained for the greater calling on his life? I don't think he would have. David also could have just delivered himself. He could have killed Saul. He had the reputation to get away with it, but he still didn't because he knew it wasn't what God had. David rested in God's will rather than trying to force God's hand. You know, last, last week we learned of David's beginning. He never knew, in fact, that he would be king. All he knew was to be faithful. We have a saying here, uh, sometimes with staff we say, put our yes on the table. It's fun to say, but it's not fun when you're in the wilderness. It's not fun when you get a diagnosis. It's not fun when you lose a job. 
It's not fun when your family's falling apart or you don't know what to do with your life or you're miserable, or you're lonely, or you're depressed. That's not fun to say, I'm gonna put my yes on the table. It's, it's a lot of fun when things are going well. But if we can adopt that perspective that it's yes, God, no matter what, no matter what life faces, we can see the fruit of his promise in our life. Now, we may not see it immediately, but we'll see it someday. That may be eternity for some of us, but some of us, you can celebrate God being faithful, yep. We may not see that fruit now. We may not see that fruit ever, but we'll see it in eternity because we know that if God did it for David and did it for all of these other heroes, he's gonna do it for us. And so I wanna encourage you today, family, if we can just settle with being okay in the wilderness, if we can just shift our mindset to say, you know what, God actually made that. And God actually needs it for me to know him greater and deeper, that is our ultimate desire as followers of Christ. And so if we can just be okay with realizing that those two things go hand in hand, it'll make these seasons a lot easier to get through. Now I wanna tell you a story about my life, about a wilderness that I faced. I'm from a really small town, uh, 4,000 people, and I was a pretty good athlete while I actually got um, a soccer scholarship out of high school. Soccer was one of my uh, you know, life passions. My coach played for the Colorado Rapids, an MLS team, and then he played for a national championship team. And his coach actually ended up at UNM. And if you've been in Albuquerque for a long time, they were really good for a while, the men's soccer program. Now it's gone. Um, but anyway, just to tell you that story, so my coach is connected to him, and I'm a natural left foot uh, defender, and so it's kind of a very rare position. And my coach saw potential and said, I think you should play college, but you need some training. And so uh, I had a couple offers at the D2 level, and I stayed in state specifically to transfer UNM, saying, that's the plan. That's the plan. It's like, you're going to do this, and then you're going to go accomplish your dream, bro. And so I set out, and uh, the coach that recruited us, the assistant coach, left the first day of two-a-days, and we're there with 16 new freshmen, an amazingly talented class. So I'm down there, and day one, I get a horrible injury to my calf, um, our older teammates offered us rights to the strip club, drugs, alcohol, our coach, that everything he told, like your parents in recruitment, was what, literally a 180 of a person. Um, we were offered, just in full honesty, the guys on the team, the older guys knew which girls you could have whatever you want with. As like, hey, you want to do this? Just let me know. So there's a lot of sin in the situation. And here I am. High school senior, pastor's kid from a really small town in New Mexico going and just being flooded with the wilderness. I was the only believer. The only believer in this situation with 18 to 20 guys, completely lost, completely broken, overwhelmed, not knowing what to do. And I stuck it out and I saw revival and everyone got saved. I'm so sorry to tell you. That's actually not what happened. You know what I did? I... <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad you laughed. But it's also, it's really, really sad. It's really, really sad, church family, because it's a situation I still think about years later. I was thrown in the wilderness. And it was hard. And you know what I did? I gave up on it. And I also, in that, gave up on potentially seeing all of those men come to Jesus. And it's still something that I think about and carry today because obviously God ordained me to be in that darkness, ordained me to be in that situation, and what Michael couldn't do was be faithful. And so then I think about the results of what could have been had I been faithful, had I known that, you know what, David went through the same kind of thing, even worse, because no one was trying to kill me. They're just trying to give me weed and strippers. We laugh, but it's really sad. It's really sad. And so I tell you that today to just be fully honest with you that sometimes you won't see what God has you doing in the moment, especially when it's hard, especially when it's broken, especially when it's dark. Little did David know that all of it was training, that all of it was going to make him love God in new and deeper ways. And that should be our heart's desire today to say, you know what? My submission is to whatever you have. My submission is to the hard. My submission is to the good. 
God, whatever it is, I'm gonna say my yes is on the table. Because you don't wanna end up like I did, still thinking about the fact that, man, what if? What if you had been faithful in the wilderness, Michael? Look what David did, he was faithful, and look how God used all of it. And so I say that to encourage you, family, if we can submit ourselves to the season, we never know what God is gonna do. We never know what he's gonna do in our life first, but in everybody else's life. And I truly believe that the demonstration of a believer, that what you believe and who you believe in is real, is when people watch us in the wilderness. And so I wanna take a second just to pray. If you would bow your head. I know that there are a lot of people in this room and I know that everybody has something that they would say, God, that's my wilderness. Some of us walked in with a new diagnosis today. Some of us walked in, you know, lonely. There's single people that wanna be married, God. There's people struggling with addiction, secret and known. There's mental health issues, there's family issues. Some people are here by themselves because their family's not with them. Some people are just trying to believe you, struggling with doubt, God, whatever it is, whatever that wilderness is, God, right now in the name of Jesus, I just ask that your spirit would begin to redirect our thought process and our definition of what that is. I know that it's not hard, and I'm not diminishing in any way that it hurts. But God, if we can just understand that it's ultimately for our good and for your glory and that you're gonna be with us, God, we can really change our lives. So I just ask Spirit of God, just in this moment as you're falling, that you would just begin to lighten the load. You begin to just release some of the burden of of people's wilderness today. And just let us be encouraged that just as David was faithful and your promises became true years later, God, that you had that for us. Just give us the glimpses to trust you greater. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask that every head remain bowed in this place as I wanna give an opportunity because I'm not naive to the fact that there are many people in this room that say, you know what? You talked about God today and you talked about David walking with God and I can't say that that's me. Well, the cool thing is, is right now I'm gonna give you an opportunity to make sure that that's taken care of by leading you through a prayer that's gonna help you make a decision to commit your life to Christ. And so before I do that, I wanna know who I'm praying for and if you would just raise your hand, nobody's looking around, I wanna know who I'm praying for today. Say, you know what, Michael, that's me. I want a relationship with Jesus. If you'll just take a second, amen, thank you. God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, sir, God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you, man, God bless you, sir. Anybody at the top, we'll wait. This is the greatest decision you can make. God bless you. God loves people. God loves people like David that are just real and messy and broken and all he wants to do is walk alongside us. Anybody else before we pray? Just lift up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Awesome. I see you, little guy. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm gonna lead everybody in a prayer. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much, man. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I'm gonna ask that everybody pray and support. And all this does is just help you remember the day that you said yes to Christ. We're gonna walk through the gospel and make a proclamation that he is Lord. So if you'll just repeat after me, everybody in this room say, dear Jesus, I know that I am lost and in sin without you. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again to save me. And I admit that I need you. I confess that you are Lord of my life forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate, church.